thank you, Chairpersons, um, for that introduction. And good afternoon, everybody. Um, I first of all thank the organizers for inviting me to present my talk on opiate free analgesia and anesthesia. So, um, over the next uh, 30 minutes, roughly, I'm going to talk about opioid, what is opioid free anesthesia and analgesia? What are the rational goals and indications of opioid free anesthesia and analgesia? What are the components of opioid free anesthesia and controversies and questions about opioid free anesthesia? That is, uh, what is, what does the evidence tell us? And in the end, what really matters? Now, um, I start the definition from uh, editorial by Elka Savani and Mariano uh, that has been uh, published in Anesthesia 2019, where they define opioid free anesthesia as a perioperative care strategy that maximizes non opioid modalities for anesthesia and analgesia and reserves the use of opioids for severe acute pain unrelieved sorry, by other methods from admission to discharge. So uh, this is a paradigm shift and started by Mubio and his colleagues. And this has led to a new movement, which has led to a new fashion. In the fashion industry, the uh, fashion changes according to the uh, 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 whims and um, style of the consumers. But in medical science, the fashion changes according to the needs of the patients and the caregivers. Now, um, we all know that opioids are uh, necessary for acute severe pain. They are highly effective for pain management. There are many choices are available. And however, um, opioids nevertheless are a double-edged sword. So uh, before I go uh, into the opioids, uh, let me first talk a little bit about the balanced opioid um, uh, anesthesia or balanced um, anesthesia, general anesthesia. So this um, uh, is accomplished by three clinical endpoints, such as unconsciousness, immobility, and analgesia. And the triad is uh, fulfilled by combination of the drugs along with maintenance of homeostasis, which is termed the balanced anesthesia. And arguably, opioids remain the cornerstone of an important component of balanced anesthesia. Now, we all know about uh, the problems with opioids. What is uh, little less known is the long-term adverse effects uh, that is opioid-induced hyperalgesia, immunosuppression that is increased risk of tumor recurrence and infection, and chronicization of pain. So in uh, short, the opioids have earned a bad name. Now, time has come when we have now moved from opioid-based, balanced opioid-based anesthesia to the other extreme, that is opioid-free um, uh, anesthesia and also maybe partly analgesia. Well, that's our quest. Now then, what is the goal of opioid-free anesthesia? Well, immediate goal is that... Um, uh, to avoid opioids without compromising intraoperative hemodynamic stability, provide nociception, and adequate provide ad adequate post-surgical uh, pain. So the specific um, objectives of um, OFA are prevention of opioid-related adverse effects, early recovery after ERAS uh, protocol, prevention of iatrogenic addiction, and development of chronic post-surgical pain. Then um, let us look at the indications of OFA. Now, as the surgeons are moving more towards the ERAS protocols, for every surgery, the anesthesiologists are trying to adopt o OFA techniques. Although many patients can be given OFA, but certain specific group of patients are only suitable uh, for um, appropriate um, uh, application of OFA. 
Then what are the indications of OFA? Um, so patients with obstructive sleep apnea, C patients with CRPS, patients addicted or uh, dependent on opioids, geriatric patients, patients with respiratory insufficiency, oncosurgery and bariatric surgery. So uh, let us look at the, the rationale behind non-opioid adjuncts in opioid-free anesthesia. Well, uh, now there is a distinction between pain and nociception. Basically, pain is um, an unpleasant sensory and emotional experience that requires a conscious mind. Now, the argument arises that during GF, pain is not experienced consciously. But we cannot deny that surgical insult leads to activation of nociceptive pathway, which results in nociception and also associated autonomic reactions. So non-opioid adjuncts target various components of nociceptive pathway and all the cardiovascular and the neuroendocrine response to stress. So what are the components of OFA? That is, what do we have in our material? Well, first and foremost, alpha-2 adrenergic receptor agonists. Then we have NMD antagonist ketamine, lidocaine, gabapentinoids, magnesium, acetaminophen and NSAIDs, and of course, local regional anesthetics. So I am going to touch about the drugs uh, a little bit that we have in our up in our sleeves to deal with OFA. Uh, so first is the uh, first are the alpha two adrenergic receptor agonists. We have clonidine and dexmedetomidine. They are both central and peripheral as um, um, anti nociceptive. They stimulate alpha two receptors at substantia gelatinosa also cause hyperpolarization of adrenergic neurons in the locus cerebris. So um, both on the ascending and descending pain pathway and uh, dexmedetomidine we all know is eight times more uh, uh, effective affinity for alpha-2 receptors than clonidine. Dexmedetomidine therefore has become an integral part of the ERAS protocol. But its efficacy as a sole analgesic in place of opioids remains to be determined. So this is again a recent review article published in Anesthesia. This is an RCT where uh, 1,309 patients were considered and authors um, of this um, um, article conclude that there is a moderate evidence that uh, intraoperative dexmedetomidine during general anesthesia results in lower pain outcomes during the first 24 post-operative hours when compared with remifentanil with fewer episodes of side effects. The next is the drug B is ketamine. This is an old drug, wine in a new bottle. We all know that um, this has recently generated a lot of interest in the context of OFA. Um, they have also proven opioid sparing effect in both opioid naive and tolerant patients. The other drug in our is a commonly used um, um, antiarrhythmic and uh, local amide local anesthetic lignocaine. So uh, what um, the studies find is that this may be beneficial for abdominal surgery and spine surgery, uh, but it remains controversial in other surgeries. So these are all evidence-based. So this is a, a recent Cochrane uh, um, a systematic uh, review where um, the uh, I quote from the authors where the authors say that uncertain it is uncertain whether IV perioperative lignocaine when compared to placebo or no treatment has a beneficial impact on pain scores in early post-operative phase and on gastrointestinal recovery, post-operative nausea and opioid consumption. And the authors also comment that most studies in this uh, systematic review, which is a uh, quite a high evidence, were of low quality. Then again, I come to magnesium. 
the magnesium is a NMDA blocker, prevents central sensitization. So it has diversified action. It is a bronchodilator, antiarrhythmic, antihypertensive, and it is also neuroprotective in um, preeclamptic patients. Uh, so uh, magnesium is suggested as an adjuvant in the perioperative period to control intraoperative hemodynamic responses. It decreases anesthetic requirement and also it has uh, effect on postoperative pain. So uh, although it is useful in a uh, perioperative period, but it requires a close monitoring of magnesium toxicity and uh, monitor, therefore, monitor clinical signs and symptoms uh, along with continuous ECG monitoring. And uh, the uh, scientific evidence says that the final role in OFA is not clear. So next we come GABA pentinoids. Uh, this has come in a big way in chronic pain management and has been recommended by ACA and APS for multimodal management of post-operative pain. So uh, these bind to, we all know that alpha to delta subunit of presynaptic voltage-gated calcium channels, and uh, these inhibit the uh, uh, nociceptive transmission. It also activates the anti-nociceptive descending inhibitory pathway, and they have a role in perioperative opioid sparing. However, um, a post operative analgesic potential as a part of multimodal non opioid analgesia has been challenged by two well conducted uh, recent meta analysis one in Acta Anesthesia Scammy Medica 2016, the other published in British Journal of Anesthesia 2017. So authors of these uh, meta-analysis are of opinion that this increased incidence of uh, post-operative respiratory depression and they forbid the use of gabapentinoids in perioperative eras. We are all aware of the side effects of gabapentinoids uh, like sedation, visual disturbance, neurocognitive dysfunction, etc. So next is a everyday use a drug, very commonly used paracetamol. It is a antipyretic and has moderate analgesic potential. And it has become um, our, uh, implicit in our regular day-to-day -day practice. So, so when used with other non-opioid adjuvants, this reduces the need of opioids in the post-operative period, even for major sources. So now, therefore, um, paracetamol IV has become an integral part of um, ERAS protocol. And, um, but one needs to be careful about um, hepatotoxicity associated with uh, paracetamol. Well, NSAIDs are again strongly recommended analgesics for post-surgical pain, along with paracetamol for opioid sparing effects. But one should be wary of the side effects that take the dysfunction deallied. Um, uh, cardiovascular and thrombotic complications, etc. So then uh, the question is then, have we reached the OFA, end of OFA era? Not so fast. There are plenty of questions, debates, and controversies. So let us see what the evidence tells us. Now, uh, in a recent editorial uh, published in 2019, um, there was a pro con debate. Now, uh, the proponents of pro uh, opioid free anesthesia writes that damned if you don't use opioids during surgery. And in the same issue, uh, in the con debate, uh, the person um, writes that is Lurk and Rachman, uh, famous people indeed, write that it is is it too early to adopt opioid free anesthesia today? And then in the same issue, they uh, publish an invited commentary where Francis Vekemans um, uh, uh, writes on opioid free anesthesia. Is it still a debate? So the question is then what is opioid free anesthesia? So let us first define what is opioid free anesthesia 
is when no opiates during intraoperative period only, or opiate-free analgesia when no opiates during the post-operative periods as well. Traditionally, in the context of intraoperative period under GN, this is now extrapolated to local regional anesthesia and broadened to the uh, perioperative period. So then, uh, what is the time for opiate free anesthesia? Is it the surgical time? Is it the anesthesia time? Or is it the whole perioperative time? So then, uh, with this question in our mind, how do we choose effective uh, non opiate components of um, OFA? Uh, we all know that many components are available. So the main question that intrigues us are which one of this, in which combination should we use? And uh, uh, will it provide quick and safe recovery after operation? The, then the biggest question that comes to mind is that which specific multimodal analgesia combination can replace opioids entirely? And uh, this is our main question. So various hospitals are practicing OFA and they have their own cocktails. Now research is now going on to determine which of these cocktails would be most effective as OFA and which procedures are suitable. And this OFA technique is uh, uh, applicable for uh, and or for which patients. So now, uh, so let us uh, delve into the evidence that we have so far in a so in this, I'm going to talk about a little bit about the efficacy. I'm going to touch upon the safety of OFA and also vis-a-vis -vis opioid-based anesthesia and opioid-free anesthesia. So coming to opioid-free anesthesia versus opioid-based anesthesia, uh, uh, in a, this is a very recent review. Uh, published by, this is a narrative review published by the Santana et al. in uh, Anesthesiology uh, in 2021. And uh, the authors of this, it's a, a big uh, review, the authors of this study come to the conclusion, they have certain questions and they try to answer those questions. Uh, do opiate-free strategies have benefits beyond and above the opiate sparing strategies? Well, let's see what the authors write today. There is no evidence. Multimodal analgesia can lead to a significant opiate sparing. At this time, the clinical benefits of such limited opioid use now, is a complete opioid sparing possible in the context of existing multimodal opioid sparing strategies? Yes, but only in some contexts and procedures. Do opioid free strategies prevent persistent opioid use or overprescription? Well, it's no. The existing literature do not support the hypothesis that avoidance of opioids will prevent persistent opioid use. But <clears throat> the, another recent article uh, published um, is, uh, says that total opioid-free general anesthesia can improve post-operative outcomes after surgery without evidence of adverse effects on patient safety and pain management. Again, this is a systematic review and a meta-analysis. So in this uh, uh, important study, the author studied 26 RCTs and included 1,934 patients. And uh, common interventions were laparoscopic gynecological surgery, upper GI surgery, breast surgery. Now, authors say that post-operative opioid consumption was significantly lower in opioid free group and they had reduced post-operative events. But however, there was no difference in length of PACQ or post-anesthesia care stay and overall post-operative pain between the two groups. But again, there is an insert where the editorial comments are added with this article, just in the first page of this article. 
where the editor writes given the limited certainty of evidence across all out, uh, outcomes if, uh, uh, and evidence from future high quality RCTs on this topic is needed before using opioid free general anesthesia in everyday clinical practice. So we have not come to any conclusion. So we, the, we are still undecided about the efficacy and the jury is still out. Let's, let's let us see the safety of OFA versus opioid-based anesthesia. Now, again, uh, this, is, um, uh, this is another um, article uh, where balanced opioid-free anesthesia with dexmedetomidine versus balanced anesthesia with remifentanil for major or intermediate non-cardiac surgery. Again, this is published in Anesthesia very recently in 2021. So uh, what does this article tell us? That is new, that it is a randomized, uh, blinded, multi-center trial patients where patients are undergoing non-cardiac surgery receives a standard anesthetic featuring lidocaine and ketamine plus either remifentanil or an alternative anesthetic where dexmedetomidine was substituted. So the primary outcome composed of post-operative hypoxemia, uh, ideas, cognitive dysfunction, and these were more common in patients receiving opioid-free anesthesia. Importantly, opioid-free anesthesia with dexmedetomidine was associated with severe bradycardia, and the study was terminated early for that reason. So, it, although less post-operative opioid consumption and uh, um, vomiting, the patients of uh, the results suggest that opioid-free balanced anesthesia is not as outstanding when compared with intraoperative opioids. And uh, therefore, it raises the question about the benefit of eliminating um, intraoperative opioids and using dexmedetomidin when lidocaine and ketamine are already used. So again, we are undecided about the safety of um, OFA versus OBA. The jury is still out. We have come a long way from inhalational anesthesia to shift to balanced general anesthesia. Then we have come to opioid-based anesthesia where we have balanced general anesthesia. Then we shift to low opioid, low anesthesia or optimal balanced general anesthesia. Then we trade into OFA where we consider feasibility and safety of no intraoperative opioids. Opioid analgesics were, are kept as a rescue for post-operative analgesia. And then we, we reach the next question, that is opioid-free anesthesia and analgesia. And this is the ultimate step. And is it feasible and is it safe? So we can apply multimodal analgesia for all patients. However, for some patients when indicated, we may add gabapentinoids, beta blockers, NMD antagonists, and some chronic pain interventions as well. So how to translate the potential benefits of OFA in post-operative and post-discharge periods? And probably this is the moot question in entire area of OFA. Does casual, mindless opioid use during perioperative period lead to chronic adverse effects of opioids even up to uh, chronic um, opioid addiction? Well, there is no convincing data so far. So um, what is important is that it is very important uh, for we caregivers to balance the patient comfort, recovery, and long-term safety. And to be successful on this ground, the patients provided with OFA must be able to document good quality of recovery, good quality of life later without adverse le uh, legacy of chronic opioids, uh, but also with a persistent pain-free state. And this remains our unmet challenge. So again, uh, there is another editorial in anesthesiology 
where uh, Karash and his colleague writes opioid free and special time to regain our balance. So this was again published in uh, very recently, and this is an important landmark editorial uh, in 2021. So I quote from the authors that opioids are the most efficacious analgesics available in many situations and remaining multimodal components alone are insufficiently effective against moderate to severe pain. And no amount of wishing will turn acetaminophen into hydromorphone. So there are two misconceptions about opioid free anesthesia. The myth number one is that opioid use in the perioperative period is a factor behind the opioid crisis in North America. The fact is no. Well, I quote, notably absent from this entire historical narrative is any mention of, of association with or causal attribution of opioid crisis to intraoperative and immediate postoperative use of opioids to treat moderate to severe pain. Myth number two, Eris advocates complete ban on perioperative opioid use. The fact is no. It, uh, so published in 2019, uh, Gustav uh, San and et al. Say, writes that enhanced Recovery protocols do not universally advocate for opioid eradication over rational use. Even the most recent enhanced recovery guidelines state that opioids cannot necessarily be avoided and that analgesia is best provided by opioid sparing and not by opioid eradication. So in the end, then what is more important? Comfort that is pain control or safety, that is absence of major adverse events. So then uh, if we judiciously use opioids, time-limited monitors, lowest effective dose regime, along with non-opioid adjuncts, we can achieve this. And what is wrong with that? So coming back to the question, opioid sparing versus opioid eradication. Opioid eradication should not become the ultimate goal in itself. So in conclusion, it is again, I quote that <clears throat> it is time for opioid pendulum to swing back from unjustified extreme of opioid eradication to a more balanced and rational approach. There is a Goldilocks zone or a safe zone for opioids in which patients are provided the optimal balanced analgesia with minimal or, uh, or no side effects or risks. So in the end, I again come back to the first uh, slide that what is opioid free anesthesia. And I quote the authors from the editorial in anesthesia. Perhaps the evidence one day will tell us that not opioids are bad as long as they are used sparingly for appropriate indications within the context of multimodal analgesia. And innovative technology may help prevent opioid diversion and overdose. If all anesthetists implemented this strategy in future, we will no longer need the term opioid free anesthesia because we will all agree to call it anesthesia. Thank you very much.